third stage supernova remnants, ones that have occurred millions of years ago. About if this universe is young, say about 7,000 years old, then we should see about two recently exploded stars. If it is young, we should see about 125 in the second stage, ones that have occurred just in the last hundreds of years to tens of thousands of years ago. And if it's young, we should see no supernova remnants that occurred millions of years ago because there hasn't been enough time for those gas and dust clouds to expand that far out. Now, a good test of a model, a good test of the reliability of any theory is how well does it predict what we observe? Now, let's test both these. What have we actually observed out there? Well, we've actually observed about five recently exploded stars. So both models are doing pretty good prediction there. Both doing pretty good there. Now, how many second stage have we observed? About 200. Which model is doing the better predictive capability there? The young universe. And we have found or observed zero third stage supernova remnants. What does that suggest now? What this is suggesting is this universe is not old enough for to have all these star explosions or supernova remnants out there. In other words, evidence for one position is evidence against the other position. The evidence here clearly supports a young universe. Well, let's go to another one, galaxy formation. Galaxies come in different shapes. And one of these shapes is called a spiral galaxy. You observe it and you see it by these long arms spiraling around behind it. And these spiral galaxies have their shape. And if these spiral galaxies are billions of years old, what we believe is they should not exist out there anymore. See, as these galaxies are rotating around, these spirals will generally lose their shape and will just have one great big glob of a galaxy. And the estim estimation is these galaxies, these spiral galaxies, should lose their shape between one and two billion years of rotating around. Now, here's the problem. When we look out there and identify what are supposed to be some of the oldest areas of the universe, some of the oldest galaxies, they still have their spiral shape. What does that suggest? Well, based on all our current calculations, it suggests these galaxies are not tens of billions of years old, but less than the required age for an old universe. Again, evidence for one position is evidence against the other. Well, let's take a look at galaxy formation, because that seems to be a problem, because the evolutionists don't even know how galaxies formed yet. But here's a book called The Facts on File Dictionary of Astronomy, written in 1994. Now, this book has to be true because it has the word facts in there. And this is what they have to say. Galaxies must have condensed out of the gases expanding from the Big Bang. Details of the formation of galaxies are still highly uncertain, as is their subsequent evolution. Now, notice the words must have. That means they don't have a clue. They're just assuming it happened because of a belief in evolution not based on any observable science. So why is this statement any more scientific than in the beginning God created? You see, we're being taught a faith in our science classrooms. Our students are being forced to listen to and hear a faith called evolution. We need to keep science to the science classrooms, not somebody else's faith. So we've looked at the two models. We've looked at evidence for age. Now let's look at the origin of stars. Where did all these trillions of stars come from? And again, I want to use this statement. Are we being given all the evidence or just selected data to support a particular idea called evolution? Well, let's look at the different models for how stars originated. The evolution model postulates that stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. The theistic model assumes stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. Notice there's no difference between those two models there. But the biblical model clearly states that on day one, God made the Earth, and on day four, he made the stars. So we have a difference in these models now. 
Well, let's take a look what a prominent astronomer has to say out there, Dr. Hugh Ross. He's an astronomer and also one of the leaders in this progressive creationist movement. And this is his statement about star formation. And he says this, the entire process of stellar evolution is by natural processes alone. We do not have to invoke divine intervention at any stage in the history of the life cycle of the stars that we observe. Now notice he's saying this, we don't need to invoke God at any stage of stellar formation. That means the origin of stars or any part of the stars formation or evolution process. Now, is that statement consistent with the Bible? Well, let's take a look. What does the Bible have to say about stars? Well, Genesis 1.16 says this, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Right there, that says that statement by the progressive creationist movement is absolutely wrong. But you know, the Bible even says more. Isaiah 40, 26 says this, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? The Bible teaches clearly that God made the stars. Psalm 8, 3 says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. And there's more. Exodus 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Six days he made everything. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the host of them. Psalm 148, verse 5 says, For he commanded, and they were created. Isaiah 45, 12 says, I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. And then Nehemiah 9, 6 says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host. John 1, 3 says, All things were made by him. Revelation 4.11 says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So is stellar formation by natural processes compatible with Scripture? Absolutely not. Right there that says the entire progressive creationist movement is false. They are not teaching the Bible. It is by the word of the Lord that the heavens and the host of the heavens, the stars, the moon, and the sun were created. The Bible is very clear on that issue. So let's take a scientific look at star formation. How are stars formed? What is the popular theory out there for how stars are formed? When we open up these textbooks and we read about astronomy, we read all these other books, they talk about, first of all, we have to have this gas and dust cloud. This gas and dust cloud is swirling around out there. And as it swirls around and around, it begins to gravitationally collapse in on itself, and a star is formed. Is that true? Absolutely not. You can go to your basic physics books and read about gas pressures and find out that kind of a statement is not true. See, as a gas and dust cloud swirls around, it will begin to gravitationally collapse in on itself. But what, cause, what happens as a result of that is called heat pressure. And that heat pressure from all those gas molecules moving faster and faster will cause that gas cloud to expand out and overtake the gravitational input. So as a cloud swirls around and around, it will not gravitationally collapse. It will expand. Now, it is theoretically possible to collapse, but it has to be such a condensed form to overtake the heat pressure. But we see none of that out there. Let's see what some of the scientists have to say about their observations of gas and dust clouds. Again, Don DeYoung, PhD in physics, writes, the complete birth of a star has never been observed. The principles of physics demand some special conditions for star formation and also for a long time period. A cloud of hydrogen gas must be compressed to a sufficiently small size so that gravity dominates. And then he concludes, in space, however, almost every gas cloud is light years in size, hundreds of times greater than the critical size needed for a stable star. As a result, outward gas pressures cause these clouds to spread out farther, not contract. Here's Fred Whipple in his book, The Mystery of Comets, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian Institute Press, says this, 
precisely how a section of an interstellar cloud